Welcome to Little Steps Big Gains and our five part series on the evaluation of upper limb ataxia. Here, episode one, the role of the cerebellum. Ataxia, that is Latin for loss of order. And it's clinically characterized by two things, tremor, and lack of coordination, and we're gonna dive into both of those. But first, we really need to know that a taxi is a really big, it's an umbrella term, and it can be split into two categories. First, it can be a symptom. That individual, they have ataxia. They have a lack of coordination from something acquired, like multiple sclerosis, cerebellar tra a tumor, cerebellar stroke. That would cause the symptom of ataxia. But on the flip side, we do need to know that in and of itself, ataxia can be a disorder genetically inherited, like something like spinocerebellar ataxia. However, despite the fact that it could be a symptom, either way, symptom or a diagnosis, it has a common denominator. That is the cerebellum. So here's a picture of our functional subdivisions, okay? Right down the middle, between the dotted lines in the middle vermis is the spinocerebellum. This part of the cerebellum is responsible for motor execution, executing our movements. Now, on either side is the cerebrocerebellum, okay, laterally. This part is responsible for timing our movements. And then on the very bottom, that little orange strip, that is the vestibulocerebellum. It controls equilibrium, the movement of the eye, head, and neck. So now that we know those three functional subdivisions, how do they apply, manifest themselves? Well, the cerebellum has a few different roles. First off, it has a huge role in balance equilibrium, and then motor planning. First, balance. Okay, in order to maintain our balance, our brain needs to know where we are. It needs to know are you too far to the left, the right, back, so that it can correct and we can maintain our balance, right? Now, in order for the brain to know where we are, it relies on information from three sensory systems giving it information. Uh, I, this is a lot of information, so I have a video linked in the description below that talks about these sensory systems, how they play a role in our balance, and there's, it is really interesting, so check it out below. But as a quick review, first we have the visual system. The eyes, it tells the brain where we are, right? Hey, I'm tipping forward, I'm tipping backwards. Uh, respond, right? Second is a really big word, but hey, hang in there. It is the somatosensory system. Two things, proprioception from the limbs, the ligaments, the muscles, are they lengthening, shortening? Um, and second would be at the bottom of the feet, touch, pressure, vibration, okay? Hey, you're tipping back. Your pressure in your heels tells your brain you're tipping, respond. And then third, it sounds kind of intimidating, but it's the vestibular system. This is in the inner ear and it is separate from the auditory system, separate. This vestibular apparatus talks to the brain and tells it where we are relative to gravity in our head position. Are you looking to the left? Are you looking up? Uh, are you bending down to pick something up? It tells the brain where we are throughout that movement so that the brain can respond. Now, where does the cerebellum come in with all of this? Well, all of that information as it comes to the brain, the cerebellum plays a huge role in organizing it. So if we have damage or degeneration there, our brain is gonna be pretty confused or have a hard time organizing all of that so that it can respond and maintain our stability, equilibrium, and our posture. Motor planning. Remember the cerebellum has those three functional subdivisions? Right down the middle, the spinocerebellum is responsible for executing our movements. On the side, the cerebrocerebellum for timing our movements. So if we have damage or degeneration to those parts of the cerebellum, we're gonna struggle with that, executing and timing our movements, causing a lack of coordination. Now, not only that, but the cerebellum plays a big role in what is called error-based learning. What does that mean? Okay, so as we do a movement, a goal intended target or movement, um, such as reaching into a cabinet or taking a step, the limb is gonna constantly talk to the brain about where it is along the way. Is it too far to the left, to the right? Because if it is off trajectory, it needs to get the cerebellum involved. The cerebellum does three things. It predicts the movements ahead of time. It corrects the current errors. Are you off course? Correct. And then it remembers those errors to prevent them from reoccurring in the future. 
So damage or degeneration of cerebellum is going to have a really hard time with correcting the errors, remembering the errors to prevent them from reoccurring in the future. So those are some things that researchers textbooks want to teach us. But what about the ataxia community? What do they want to teach us? To answer that question, I reached out to six different support groups and I asked them, what do you want us to know about ataxia? I then put together a video with top five responses and I linked that in the description below. It's called what we need to know and who we need to listen to. But here's a summary of the top five responses. Number one, ataxia is more than just a lack of coordination and balance. Now let's apply some of the things we just learned to support this statement. First off, remember, as we move, the cerebellum kicks in to correct our errors, but then it also remembers them. So if we have a hard time remembering our errors, we put forth a lot of extra exertion with a lot of extra movements. That is why individuals report a lot of fatigue dizziness, vertigo. Remember, we just learned about the functional subdivisions. And on the very bottom, that little orange strip, that was the vestibulocerebellum, responsible for talking to the brain about our head position, equilibrium, causing impairments there, causing dizziness and vertigo. Um, things like lack of coordination in the eye muscles. Individuals report a lot of visual deficits. The eyes are also giving information about where we are in space, our limbs. When we reach for an object, first our limb kicks in, but then it cuts us short. That very last portion, the eyes kick in. They, they get to the target first before the limb, and then they help the limb make that final movement precise. If we have a hard time coordinating the eye movements, if we're over or under shooting, that's really going to affect our coordination. Hence why individuals report a lot of visual deficits. Running out of breath, the lack of coordination in the respiratory system, the diaphragm with the voice, having a hard time coordinating our uh, speech where we may get slurred speech or slowed speech. Those are a few extra symptoms people report and why they experience those things. Number two, slowed speech or slurred speech does not indicate cognitive impairments. One individual wrote and he said, just because I talk slower does not mean I'm cognitively impaired. Now let's apply what we've learned, right? The cerebellum plays a big role in executing, planning, and timing our muscles. That includes the muscles of the mouth, the, the mouth, the throat, and then the respiratory system, the timing of our breathing. So having difficulty with that slurred speech, slowed speech does not indicate cognitive impairments. Number three, symptoms vary day to day and person to person. Remember the functional subdivisions. Depending on where the damage or degeneration is in the cerebellum may change the manifestations. Motor execution, motor timing, uh, dizziness, equilibrium. It all depends on where and how the cerebellum is affected. But not only that, people want us to know that symptoms vary day to day. Brain must, might be really fatigued from all the extra exertion one day. One woman wrote, uh, one day I might be able to walk normally or unassisted and the next day I may not be able to walk at all. That's just because our symptoms, they do vary from day to day. Number four, I am not drunk. You can see why this was a very common response. Individuals have that slurred speech, slowed speech, lack of coordination, gait abnormalities. So there's a lot of times there's a miscommunication or misunderstanding that people look intoxicated. To prevent this misunderstanding, an individual can go to the National Taxia Foundation and get a card, put it in their wallet that explains their medical condition. That can help prevent a lot of this misunderstanding in the future. And number five, the last most common response people gave me was, do not underestimate me. Now, I do think this is common. We see somebody with significant balance impairments and we're maybe a little too cautious. We don't want them to fail, so we want to set them up for success. But people were responding saying, challenge me. Don't cut me short. Don't take away my opportunities. Now, to support this, I want to show you a video of one testimony. This is my friend Alfred with Ataxia. He said, I want to ride a bike. Let's end today by looking and watching his determination and his resilience.
And that was episode one of our series on the evaluation of upper limb ataxia. We talked about the role of the cerebellum. So important to lay that foundation. Our next four follow-up episodes are really going to be fantastic. Our next one, we're going to talk about clinical characteristics of ataxia, manifestations, why we see those things. It's going to be really good. After that, we'll talk about tremors screening tools and standardized testing. It's going to be fantastic. So come back, check out those episodes and then check out other free educational videos and some fantastic free 30 day home exercise programs here on Little Steps Big Gains.